All right, thanks for coming. So I'll be talking about extended formulations and information complexity. So I meant this as sort of um, a general introduction to both extended formulations and how to use tools from information theory to prove lower bounds against linear programs. So let me start off with introducing extended formulations by an example, because I think uh, an example really helps crystallize why this definition is the way it is and why it's interesting in some cases. So let me start off with a nice example called the permutahedron, which is a polytope in n dimensions, which all you do is you take a vector, a fixed vector t, which has integer entries, so 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n, so a length n vector, and you take all possible permutations of this one fixed vector and you take their convex hull. So this gives me a very simple polytope in n dimensions, but when measured by something like how many facets it has, it's actually very complex because it has exponentially many facets. So this is not hard to see. In fact, it follows just because, you know, if you think about a subset S of indices and I add up the entries of my vector just restricted to that set, then I add up these X sub I's for I and S, well, how small can this possibly be for any point in the permutahedron? The smallest it could ever be if was, is if those values are 1, 2, all the way up to the size of s. So in this way, you know, this right-hand side, I get uh, s plus 1, choose 2. And I get a valid inequality on the permutahedron. And it's not too hard to see that it really is a facet of the permutahedron. But you can actually do much, much better just using the connection between permutations and permutation matrices. So even for the simple example, I can drastically reduce the representational complexity in terms of how many linear inequalities I need if I instead think about generating P as the projection of a higher dimensional polytope. So if I instead I take Q to be a polytope in n squared dimensions where it's the set of doubly stochastic matrices. So matrices which are entry-wise non-negative and whose rows and columns all sum to exactly one, then it turns out not hard to see that if I take any such A and multiply it by the vector t, then what I'm going to get out is necessarily a point that is in the permutahedron. And that the converse is true, too, that actually, you know, you can actually represent every point in the permutahedron exactly this way. So this is a simple example, which I haven't filled in all the details to prove that it actually does work. But it's a case where you can go from exponentially many facets down to just n squared facets, you know, quadratic number. Because all I need to do is to define the constraints that you know, Q is a set of doubly stochastic matrices. So this is the idea of an extended formulation more generally. So you can look at this picture. But more generally, the extension complexity of a polytope is what you do is you have some polytope, and you'd like to represent it as the shadow of a higher dimensional polytope. So you'd like to say, how many inequalities do you need on a higher dimensional polytope Q? What's the best you can get away with? so that you can express the original polytope you care about as the projection of Q. And we've already seen one example. So if we take the permutahedron, then that's a polytope with exponentially many facets. And I showed you that you can get away with n squared for its extension complexity. Turns out you can actually do n log n. And believe it or not, that connection is through the AKS sorting network. So that's a fun little uh, result of Gomans. There's just to give you some more intuition, if you take like a regular n-gon in the plane, so in two dimensions, then actually it's known that its extension complexity is log n. But this is a very subtle notion, because if I take that same n-gon and I perturb its vertices ever so slightly, its extension complexity goes up from logarithmic to root n. And the way that I want to think about this, because I'll really be interested in using tools from information theory to prove lower bounds against extended formulations, the way that I want to think about this in general is through quantifiers, because you can always rotate P and Q so that you really obtain P from a very simple type of projection where you're just cutting away some parts of the vectors. So you can think about an extended formulation in general as instead you're giving P a different name, where you think about it as all the x's for which there exists a y, so that the concatenated vector x, comma y lives in this higher dimensional polytope Q that hopefully has few constraints. So in this way, you can actually think about a nice analogy with quantifiers and Boolean formula. So the same way that you know, quantifiers allowing their exists can help you drastically reduce the size of functions that you want to express with simple gates. You know, the same way, we really can drastically reduce the size of, uh, of the number of facets we need by, um, by allowing quantifiers, by allowing extended formulations, 
And we really hope is that we can prove lower bounds against explicit hard polytopes. So the same way, you know, one of the polytopes which has, um, you know, really been of interest in this area is the TSP polytope. So the same way that there are polytopes like the permutahedron, which, you know, things like the connections between permutations and permutation matrices give you new names for those old polytopes, so too you think that there are polytopes which are just intrinsically hard to describe more compactly. So one such natural candidate is the TSP polytope. Or what you can do is you can take the complete graph Kn, and now you can look at any set of edges that forms a complete you know, Hamiltonian tour. And you can look at 1f, so the indicator function of that set of edges. So in this way, this is a polytope in n choose two-dimensional space, where you take the convex hull of all of these indicator functions of sets of edges that really are Hamiltonian circuits. But the issue is that this polytope is very difficult. Certainly, you know, if you could optimize over it linear functions, then you really could find the minimum cost tour. So you'd have p equal to np. And really, the goal in extended formulations is to try and prove unconditional representational lower bounds that polytopes like this one are just intrinsically hard, and they need tons and tons of inequalities to actually perfectly express them. So the other thing I want to mention is that uh, sometimes there's this confusion in this literature about you know, how this is related to proving, you know, to proving things like p not equal to np. Well, in general, when you prove an unconditional lower bound on representing this polytope, you've said nothing about p not equal to np. In fact, the other is also not true, that these aren't even you know, things that would follow from p not equal to np. But you know, the main part and the first part of this talk, what I want to describe is I want to describe a general program. Yanakakis set forth in 1990 a very interesting program for trying to prove lower bounds against this geometric parameter, against, you know, is there a representation for explicit hard polytopes like this? And the way that he did it was through a really amazing connection between geometry and algebra. So this parameter, the extension complexity, will turn out to be related to something called the non-negative rank. And ultimately in this talk, what I want to do is I want to show you how you can use tools from information theory actually to prove lower bounds against non-negative rank and against representational questions like this one. So there's been a ton of work in this area, so I'm going to give you a very abridged history. So Yanakakis in 1990, and uh, I guess what I like to call the world's best review. So there was a paper which had claimed p equals np by giving a you know, n to the eighth size LP for TSP. And uh, he showed that, no, the paper was wrong. You know, it's one thing to just say, it probably doesn't work, but he actually showed that well, it was wrong for a sort of fundamental reason that it was giving a symmetric extended formulation. And it's just impossible to give a symmetric extended formulation for the traveling salesman polytope, which has sub-exponential size. Now, the issue is that uh, you know, there's a lot of work in the interim, which showed us things like asymmetric extended formulations really can be much more powerful than symmetric ones. And finally, in a really amazing result of Fiorini et al., what they did was they showed an exponential lower bound for the TSP problem, the original polytope that I described on the previous slide. In fact, it was based on an even stronger 2 to the n lower bound for a polytope that's related to the clique problem. And moreover, it was, you know, it's almost amazing that it was just non-deterministic communication complexity that was used to prove this lower bound. So the same way you can see a sort of progression of techniques in extended formulations that go through a very similar progression of techniques that have been used in communication complexity. So in fact, after that, Braun et al. showed lower bounds even on approximate extended formulations, things that roughly try and get this polytope associated with clique, right? Within a root n factor, they showed an exponential lower bound. And their approach was through Rasborov's rectangle corruption lemma. And what we'll be talking about a little bit today is about uh, using tools from information theory to prove stronger lower bounds that actually any polytope that gets this, um, uh, that even gets within an n to the 1 minus epsilon factor right is actually itself going to have exponential size. So in a sense, you know, we already had things like Hastad's, uh, you know, lower bounds that clique is hard to get right within a factor of n to the 1 minus epsilon. And these are the unconditional uh, analogs of this. And also later in this workshop, uh, Sebastian Pakuda will be talking about uh, also about the connection between information theory and geometry, and some really nice work about using common information, which is a different information theoretic tool, to prove lower bounds against, in average case sense, against extended formulations. Uh, just to sort of tell you a little bit more about the story, 
Chanadel ended up proving lower bounds against max cut based on reductions to the Shirley Adams hierarchy. Uh, Thomas proved a lower bound against uh, perfect matching, so proved a 2 to the omega and lower bound for extended formulations for perfect matchings. And in a very recent work, uh, Lee et al. You know, finally answered what are, what's one of the big open questions, or was one of the big open questions in this area, about proving lower bounds not just against linear programs, but against semi-definite versions of extended formulations. In any case, let me you know, now cut to the chase. So let me tell you about Yannikakis' program and tell you where information theory fits in. So the first way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to describe his general connection between geometry and algebra. And the second part, I'm just going to tell you about an abstract information theoretic framework. I think it helps to see this framework twice, so then we're going to apply it actually to uh, the correlation polytope, which is one of the polytopes that comes up over and over again in this literature. So Yannick Cox's factorization theorem is really, you should think about it as addressing this question, how are we going to prove lower bounds against extended formulations? Extended formulations can be you know, quite strange and difficult to reason about. And at the core of it, you know, I'll make this more precise in a second, he proved that this geometric parameter that we care about, the extension complexity of a polytope, turns out to be exactly related to an algebraic parameter of some object I'm about to define right now called the slack matrix. So it's just a complete reformulation, an equivalent reformulation of what this geometric parameter I defined was. And the idea is you define a slack matrix, which encodes the rough geometry of the polytope. That's what you want to preserve through an extended formulation. So let me show you by example. We'll take some polytope in two dimensions to keep it simple. And my drawing abilities are limited. So we take our polytope in two dimensions. And what we want to do is we want to define a very large matrix, which encodes the geometry. So every row is going to represent a different facet of the polytope. And every column represents a different vertex. So in this way, for example, vj might map to this column. And this facet may map to this row. So I've defined this extremely large object, the slack matrix, at least in terms of what its rows are and what its columns are. And all that I have to do to fully define this is I have to tell you how to put in the entry in the corresponding facet and vertex, so which in this row and this column. And all it's going to be is informally, it's the slack. It's how slack this vertex is on this given facet. Or to think about it geometrically, all you do is you take the perpendicular distance. So if I take bi minus ai inner product with vj, then this quantity is how much slack I have on this given constraint. It's a non-negative value, and I put that in the corresponding row and column. So this is the slack matrix. It's a very, very large entry-wise non-negative matrix which encodes the geometry namely how the different vertices and facets interact and how loose they are on each other. And the basic idea is that an algebraic parameter on this object is going to exactly capture the extension complexity. And this is the notion of non-negative rank. So this is what I'll really be interested in proving lower bounds against. So non-negative rank also has lots of applications in machine learning and so on. But the basic idea is we start with our entry-wise non-negative matrix S. And the goal is to write S as the sum of rank 1 non-negative matrices, and to use as few of them as possible. So you know, the way to think about this, so precisely what it is, it's the smallest R, so that I can write S as the sum of R rank 1 non-negative matrices. And you know, the key point is, this should look very familiar with the usual notion of rank, because if I drop this non-negativity restriction and say, given a matrix, what's the smallest R so that I can write it as the sum of R rank 1 matrices. That's precisely the rank. Non-negativity is this extra constraint on each of these factors in here, which is where the information theory is going to come in. But the key point is what we're really hoping for is that the non-negative rank can be much, much larger than the rank of a matrix. That's the same phenomenon that some polytope in like n or n squared dimensions can nevertheless turn out to have exponential extension complexity. It's exactly a gap between these two parameters. So Yannick Cox's factorization theorem is really just this equality. The extension complexity of a polytope, a purely geometric property of what's the most concise name you can give for a polytope in terms of how many inequalities you need to define it, that turns out to be exactly equal to the non-negative rank of the slack matrix. It's a kind of amazing theorem. Its uh, proof is very short, which I will not give you. 
But the intuition for this is that it turns out the right factorization is exactly the right change of variables to reduce the number of inequalities you need. And what I really want to talk about is how to use this program to actually prove lower bounds on extended formulations by using information theory to prove lower bounds on the right-hand side. So are there any questions? Yeah, how do you um, handle approximations here? Approximate uh, I'll get into that later. That'll also that'll be something which behaves very smoothly when you talk about information theoretic tools. But let me hold off on that for the time being uh, to prevent things from being too complicated. So let me tell you about a general framework. This framework's not going to make much sense until I actually put it into action. So if this looks strange, that's fine. Uh, so let me tell you about how to use information theory here. The rough idea is we want to take a too-good-to-be-true non-negative matrix factorization and use it to sample from a distribution using too few bits of entropy. That's the plan. So one way that we can realize this plan is imagine we take our entry-wise non-negative matrix on the left-hand side. I'm going to use black and colored squares to denote non-zeros and white squares to denote zeros. What if I give you some magical set T of entries, which all have the same value in the left-hand side? So I can think about a very natural distribution where I choose one of these green squares uniformly at random. Now that has some given entropy, but I can also think about using the right-hand side to sample from that. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Imagine I look at where T occurs in all of these rank 1 non-negative matrices. And one thing I can do is I can choose one of these rank 1 matrices proportional to its total value on the blue squares, how much weight it assigns to the set T. And then once I've chosen one of those rank 1 matrices, I can choose one of the blue squares proportional to its relative value in the matrix. So in this way, if I output this square, I'm going to output that corresponding square. And it's not hard to see that because I've chosen t to be a set of entries with exactly the same value, that this procedure generates a random sample from t. But the key point is that you know, actually, based, we can use the structure of the right-hand side, the fact that it's rank 1, to show that if we have too few of these factors, we've used too few bits of entropy. So that's the general plan. Now this plan doesn't make sense until I realize it, so let's use it. Uh, and the main point is just if r, little r, the number of rank 1 terms, is too small, this procedure uses too little entropy. So let me apply it to the correlation polytope. And we'll actually get disjointness as the problem that we want to prove lower bounds for. So the correlation polytope, which plays a really key role in all of this literature, is that the very simple polytope in n squared dimensions all you do is you take every binary string A of length n. You take A times A transpose. So this is a rank 1 binary matrix. And you take the convex hull of all such matrices. That's your polytope. Now the important thing is that actually a submatrix of the slack matrix. So in the natural way, the vertices are identified with binary strings. It turns out that you can also generate a valid constraint on the correlation polytope through a binary string. And moreover, that the entry, how slack that constraint is on you know, some particular vertex, turns out to be this really nice expression, 1 minus A transpose B squared. Now why is this nice? It's nice because we can think about Alice as having the string A and Bob as having the string B, in which case whether or not this entry is 0 or non-zero is just a disjointness problem. If A and B are disjoint, then S is certainly non-zero, because I get 1 minus 0 squared. But if they uniquely intersect in just one location, then I get A transpose B is 1, and I get 1 minus 1 squared is 0. So in fact, they're really computing some sort of unique disjointness problem. So I'll very quickly tell you why this actually arises. It's a very short proof why this arises as you know, the slack matrix is it's just the manipulation on inequality. So I take what I want the slack to be, and I want to figure out a constraint that realizes that slack on some vertex. So I just expand what this inequality is, but I use the fact that A is binary, that A and B are binary to actually rewrite this term inside. So the inner product between A and B is the same thing as the inner product between a diagonal matrix with B along the diagonal and the matrix A times A transpose. And I can rearrange the inequalities. The left-hand side is non-negative. So in fact, this inequality is valid. 1 is certainly at least this quantity, where this is my vertex, and this is some direction. So this is a valid inequality. And moreover, the slack is exactly 1 minus A transpose B squared. 
So this is exactly how you get, uh, you know, disjointness as a submatrix in the slack problem. But now to realize this program that I described, what you need to do is you need to choose a set of the entries in the matrix, which all have the same value. And I'm going to do it in the natural way that you prove lower bounds for disjointness and in information complexity. I'm going to choose it over all pairs A and B, which are disjoint. So that set actually has three to the n possibilities because you know, for AI comma BI, I have three possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0. And what I'm going to do now is that really is something which all the entries are the same in the slack matrix. They're all 1 in the way I've defined it. And if I think about the sampling procedure, what it's really doing is it's saying, let me give you a different way to sample from T using the, the non-negative matrix factorization. This non-negative matrix factorization is really a way to break up the distribution into different pieces. And instead of choosing a random entry from T, I'm going to look at each of these rank 1 terms, how much it contributes to T. I'm going to choose one of them proportional to their total value. And then once I've chosen which rank 1 matrix, I'm going to output an actual pair in T proportional to its relative value. So that's just restating what the sampling procedure is. And now all we have to do is we have to account for this entropy and show that there's an information theoretic contradiction. So the key point is that we know how many bits of randomness there are in a uniformly random sample from T. There's three to the n choices for T, so we just have n times log 2 base of 3. It's very simple. Now, there are only two steps in this uh, sampling procedure. It's also very simple. You know, I have to choose this i that says which of the rank 1 matrices I'm going to sample from, because I've broken up the distribution. And this is, at most, log r, because there are only r of these matrices. So worst case, it's the uniform distribution on them. And what I claim is, at the end of the day, all I have to do is show that I've saved something on the entropy. That when I get to this last step and I've restricted to a rank 1 matrix, that instead of the naive bound of you know, n log 3 bits of entropy, as soon as I save any constant factor and I get a 1 minus delta there, this will actually imply an exponential lower bound for r. That's the point. So let's do it. So let me give you a simplified version of the argument. You know, let's say that we've already chosen which of these rank 1 matrices we're sampling from, so MI is fixed. And let's say I've fixed all of the entries in A except for AJ, and all of the entries in B except for BJ. And I'm really just concerned about how do I choose these two. See, the naive bound for this is that I would think I have three possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. That would be bad because then I'm really not gaining anything. And the question is, why have I gained something? So remember, we're sampling from MI, just restricted to all the choice we made so far. So let me just, you know, that's a submatrix of the original matrix where I plug in, you know, all the three different possibilities, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. Let me also plug in 1, 1, even though I would never consider that, just for simplicity. This is a submatrix, and the key point in all of this, this is the punchline, is that in this entry, if we really did fill in aj equals 1 and bj equals 1, we would have a pair of strings that uniquely intersects. And then the answer to unique disjointness would be 0. So that means that this matrix has to have a 0 there, because that's what the entry should be in the slack matrix. And once you put in something non-negative, you can never cancel it out again. But now I'm done, because I have a 0 in a rank 1 matrix, which means there has to be another 0 somewhere in either the same row or same column. Wherever it is, you thought that you had three possibilities of 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0, but you actually only have two possibilities. So the conditional entropy in your sampling of actually a, j, b, j is only one bit, not log 3. So there's a way to get this to work in a sort of amortized way, because I can't really fix all of a except for a, j, and all of b except for b, j. It's a very standard trick in information complexity with how exactly to use the chain rule for mutual information. But you get that same bound for actually the entire thing, that instead of n times log 3 bits of entropy, you only need n. And that implies the exponential lower bound for the correlation polytope through this information theoretic argument. So the point is a too-good-to-be-true non-negative matrix factorization would allow you to sample from some very simple distribution using too few bits of entropy. In fact, to answer Thomas's question, you can actually use this much further to proving lower bounds on even getting the polytope somewhat right.
So it turns out, for example, if you want to know now that the slack, now that the correlation polytope can't be represented very well with fewer than exponential constraints, what if instead you want to fit a polytope between the correlation polytope and some scaling up of the correlation polytope? So as C gets larger and larger, this becomes easier and easier to fit a polytope between them. That actually has a very simple effect on the slack matrix. All you do is you add C. So instead of it being the unique disjointness problem where A and B are disjoint, you have to output 1. And if they're uniquely intersecting, you have to output 0. You're instead outputting either C plus 1 or C. So it's kind of like not trying to solve unique disjointness exactly, but get some advantage over random guessing. Like trying to get a you know, half plus 1 over C type of you know, guarantee for the probability you compute it correctly. So it turns out that actually through, you can make this connection even stronger that proving lower bounds against even barely beating random guessing for communication tasks can actually show you that you can't get you know, geometric problems like the correlation polytope even approximately right within non-trivial factors. So it turns out there's actually a natural barrier for a lot of the techniques that we have for proving lower bounds for communication complexity at C is roughly root n, so that type of advantage. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you know, for example, that there are linear lower bounds for getting disjointness right with constant probability, so getting it right with three quarters probability. Now, the point is that that can actually black box be used as a way to prove a lower bound on barely beating random guessing. That if your goal is to beat random guessing by a 1 over c factor, you can actually prove that you need at least n over c squared bits. All you would do is you would just take a protocol that solves this using little o of n over c squared bits. You'd run it c squared times, take the majority vote, and then that would violate your original linear lower bound for uh, disjointness. Well, it turns out that you can actually prove a stronger lower bound, that it's not just n over c is the lower bound uh, for getting advantage 1 over c, uh, n over c squared. You can actually prove an n over c lower bound. That's exactly the type of argument, the potential function that's used in here is exactly what gets you to this extended formulation all the way up to size n to the 1 minus epsilon. So the correlation polytope, you know, the same way the clique is hard to approximate within n to the 1 minus epsilon, so too this correlation polytope has exactly the same type of property, that it's hard to get right even all the way up to n to the 1 minus epsilon, at which point it's trivial. So I think I'll stop there, but the uh, quick summary was I gave you an introduction to extended formulations, this geometric property of giving polytopes new names. It has uh, a lot of cases where you really can that's based on some cool combinatorial ideas. Uh, and there are a lot of cases where you really believe you can't, and you can prove unconditional lower bounds through this program Yanakakis introduced based on relationship between the geometry and the algebra. But in turn, you can actually think about lower bounding these purely representational questions about LPs through information theory. And that's a very smooth measure that ends up being very useful, even in proving lower bounds on approximately getting things like the correlation polytope right. So I'll end there, but thanks. Uh, uh, is there a chance we could extend the sampling argument to the lower bound PSD ring? So that's a good question. Uh, so I wonder if you can use like some sort of quantum uh, information theory. Uh, quantum information theory seems not so easy to work with. Like, I still can't wrap my head around the fact that uh, conditional entropy is not non negative and that mutual information proving it's non negative is quite non trivial. But, um, I mean, for other reasons, I've been looking at some of these quantum DeFinetti theorems, and I think there's a lot of issues there about which norms are used in uh, quantum information theory, and some of them are not, you know as strong as one would like, with like the one-way LOCC and stuff, but that's a good question. Thanks. All right, thanks.